With the 76 season rounding into the home stretch, one of the biggest surprises is the Cleveland Browns, still in the race despite playing in the NFL's strongest division. Cleveland's main weapon, Greg Pruitt, was injured last week, so against Philadelphia, Brian Seif took to the air and further enhanced his starting status by pinpointing 15 of 21 passes for 200 yards and touchdowns to Reggie Rucker and Paul Warfield. Cleveland easily outdistanced the struggling Eagles 24 to 3 and now have won five of their last six games. In Oakland, Kenny Stabler was intercepted four times by the Chiefs, but still threw for two touchdowns as the Raiders continued to live and win with the pass. With one touchdown to Fred Biletnikoff and another to Dave Casper, Stabler ran his total scoring tosses to 20 tops in the entire NFL. In winning their ninth of ten, Oakland is just one game away from clinching the Western Division title in the AFC. Inside New Orleans Superdome, the Detroit Lions were paced by quarterback Greg Glandry's 27 completions and the sure hands of tight end Charlie Sanders as the Lions rolled up 500 yards of total offense against the hapless Saints defenders. Detroit's defense is number one in the National Conference and played up to that lofty ranking with only this exception, a 69-yard bomb from Bobby Douglas to Larry Burton. That was New Orleans' one big moment on offense, but it didn't matter, for the Lions began to lose the ball whenever they got close to a score. Detroit fumbled three times, but one was especially devastating. A poor center snap was fielded by Lion punter Herman Thunderhands Weaver, who tried to run the ball out of the end zone instead of accepting a safety. Weaver coughed up the ball, which Warren Capone, number 51, gratefully accepted for a weird and winning touchdown. Saints 17, Lions 16. After their opening day loss to Washington, many of the New York Giants vowed not to shave until they beat the Redskins. Considering Washington had won 11 straight from New York, their weight and their beards appeared to be a long-term situation. With perennial backup Norm Sneed at quarterback and newcomers replacing injured regulars at several key positions, mild-mannered head coach John McVay hardly seemed the candidate to end the hold evangelical George Allen had over the Giants. But with just four minutes, 32 seconds left in what was a dead heated duel between field goal kickers, the battle was decided by the littlest giant of all. Five foot nine inch Joe Donello attempted the longest field goal of his career, a distance of 50 yards. Donello's success gave the Giants a 12-9 lead. And to some long suffering New Yorkers, it must have been the most important field goal since Pat Summerall's 49 yarder beat the Browns for the championship in Yankee Stadium two decades ago. But a first victory for New York was not yet secure. Washington drove downfield with 41 seconds showing. George Allen disdained a chip shot, which would have sent the game into overtime, and had Joe Theismann go for the winning touchdown. From the seven, a blitz by number 53 rookie Harry Carson forced Theismann to hurry his throw, which was picked off by Jim Stanky in the end zone. The longest losing streak in the Giants' 52-year history had ended against New York's fiercest rivals. For the Redskins, any hopes of a playoff berth were gone, crushed by the stunning upset.
history was made on this Sunday in the Meadowlands of East Rutherford, New Jersey. A first victory in a new stadium, the first in the NFL for new coach John McVay, and the first ever against chief tormentor George Allen. In this season of absurdities for New York fans, the Giants haven't permitted a touchdown for 10 quarters. Unfortunately, their offense hasn't scored one in 18 periods of play. No matter, though their perfect season came to an end, the New York Giants are as they used to be, winners for one week at the very least. Last week, the winless Tampa Bay Buccaneers faced the two and seven New York Jets in an NFL game of the week. Tampa Bay's biggest problem this season has been an almost non-existent offense. To put it bluntly, the Bucs have been falling all over themselves. In an effort to find a leader for his offense, Buck head coach John McKay used all three of his quarterbacks against the Jets. And if nothing else, he discovered that he has consistency at the position. Steve Spurrier has been the Buck quarterback most of this season, but when he failed to move the team, McKay brought in his newest passer, Terry Hanratty. When his newest quarterback couldn't do it, McKay put in his youngest hurler, Parnell Dickinson, whose performance was remarkably similar to Hanratty's. Three quarterbacks added up to Tampa Bay's fourth shutout in 10 games, and when the Jets saw the problem Spurrier, Hanratty, and Dickinson were having, New York elected to go without a quarterback. Actually, the Jets were going with Joe Namath in shotgun formation, not because Namath needs more time to read defenses or because he has a slow release, but simply because in the shotgun formation, Namath would be better protected. From the conventional set, Namath led the Jets to victory by moving New York to 24 points in just over one quarter. Rookie Clark Gaines' great run began the streak late in the first quarter. When Namath had the Jets safely in front, he retired from further competition, and the only touchdown in the second half was Lou Picone's 60-yard punt return that concluded a 34 to nothing beat-up of the Bucks. The Jets had their third victory of the season, while for the Buccaneers, it was loss number 10 as they continued to bumble along winless. Early in the year, Bart Starr's Packers were having similar problems in execution. But in winning four of their last six, Green Bay seemed to be moving in the right direction. That was up until last week, however. The Chicago Bears cashed two early Packer fumbles and were off to a 14-0 lead. But the pack soon got its execution back. And while the Bears could put no more points on the board, Green Bay began to close in. A 27-yard touchdown pass, Lynn Dickey to Ken Nuria of Payne, and two field goals brought Green Bay to within one point. But just as the pack was creeping back, Roland Harper's run clinched the Bears' fifth victory. While Harper had the thrill of a clinching touchdown in a 24-13 Chicago win, his running mate, Walter Payton, flew to his 1,000th yard, the first back in the NFL to soar to that mark this year. The AFC rushing leader, Lydell Mitchell, was not so fortunate, as defense keyed the Patriots' 21-14 victory over Baltimore. Mitchell gained just 52 yards, and Burt Jones could find bombs away buddy Roger Carr for just one early score.
Jones kept trying, but after his early burning, rookie Mike Haynes, number 40, intercepted two passes intended for Carr, and the NFL's highest scoring offense could put just 14 points on the board. More than anything, the Patriot defense led New England to its seventh victory in 10 starts. For the Pats got only 21 points, usually not enough to beat Baltimore. The Colts averaging 31 points in their first nine games. Steve Grogan's short touchdown pass and eighth and ninth touchdowns of the year had New England ahead 21 to 14 at the half, the ultimate final score. Desperate for the tying touchdown, Jones kept trying for a quick strike, but New England shut out the Baltimore Colts for the entire second half and moved to one game behind in the AFC East Division race behind the frustrated Colts. Hoping to emulate Sherman's troops on their march through Georgia, the 49ers visited Atlanta last week and opened on a Jim Plunkett to Gene Washington cannonade. But Atlanta's Scott Hunter and split end Alfred Jenkins set up a barrage of their own, good for scores of 34 and 21 yards. So, despite a less than professional spiking performance on this chilly, rainy day when the no-shows outnumbered those in attendance, the Falcons went on to win their third of the year, 21 to 16. And the 49ers missed a golden opportunity to take over the top spot in the NFC Western Division. Meanwhile, in the AFC West, Denver's playoff hopes got off to a shaky start. The usually reliable Rick Upchurch soon made up for his bobble as he streaked 59 yards with this Steve Ramsey pass to put the Broncos on top to stay. The Denver defense, which has given up the third fewest amount of points in the NFL this season, was true to form as they closed down the end zone and left the Charger air game in a nosedive. The nosedive turned into a crash landing when number 57 linebacker Tom Jackson intercepted this pass and turned it into the final score of the day, capping the Broncos' sixth win of the year, 17 to nothing. Meanwhile, up in Minnesota, Seahawk quarterback Jim Zorn led a surprisingly strong attack to a 7-7 first quarter tie with the Vikings. Despite the usual superlative performances by Chuck Foreman, number 44, and Fran Tarkenton, Minnesota could not breathe easy all afternoon. This beautiful Tarkenton touchdown pass, the 300th of his career, making him the first to accomplish that feat, gave the Vikings a 14-7 halftime lead. It seemed that Sammy White's catch was just the kind of play designed to break an expansion team's resolution. But the Seahawks held tough, and early in the third quarter, Zorn buzzed an 80-yard beeline to Steve Rabel, number 83, to tie the score at 14. Two Fred Cox field goals lifted the Vikings to a 20-14 lead at the end of the third period. But the fledgling Seahawks remained anxious to try their wings.
With gutty determination, Seattle fought back. Executing beautifully and looking like anything but a first-year franchise, the Seahawks drove to the Vikings' seven-yard line early in the last quarter. A Jim Zorn to Sam McCullen pass was good for a 21-20 Seattle lead, and the upset of upsets was in the making. A cool veteran like Fran Tarkenton is tough to beat. And with less than five minutes left in the game, his pass to Stu Voigt ended the Seahawks' dreams of glory 27 to 21. A close call for the playoff bound Vikings and a game to most surely be proud of for the Seattle Seahawks. In the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum last year, the Rams knocked St. Louis out of the playoffs. Number 11, Pat Hayden, was not there last year. But last week, he and Harold Jackson made it look like the same kind of game. The Rams led 14 to six at the half. And then the second half kickoff really put the Cardinals in a bind. Cullen Bryant, the 235-pound kick returner, put the Rams ahead 21 to six. And then Jim Hart finally got his offense in gear. In the second half, Hard hit on 13 of 16 passes and the cardiac card scored 24 points, just enough to catch the Rams at the gun 30 to 28 for their third consecutive hair-raising victory. Meanwhile, in Pittsburgh, another seemingly unstoppable team continued its streak. The Steelers have not only given up the fewest points in the league, but also have not given up a touchdown in their last 21 quarters. Since their horrendous start, the defense has carried the team, even allowing enough breathing room for the development of number 15 rookie quarterback, Mike Krutzek. Frank Lewis had stepped on the sideline, but his big play against the Dolphins was one of the key elements for the Pittsburgh offense. The other key element was the NFL's top-ranked running game, featuring Rocky Blyer and Franco Harris, both of whom rushed for more than 100 yards for the second straight week. The super strong Steelers stayed alive with their fifth consecutive win and their first ever over Miami, 14 to three. The Cincinnati Bengals are the team the Steelers must beat out to have a chance for the playoffs. And last week, number 21, John Hadle almost led the Oilers to the upset Pittsburgh was hoping for. Billy Johnson's catch on third and 27 was the biggest play of the first half as Houston built a surprising 10 point lead over the first place Bengals. In the second half, Cincinnati pulled out all the stops. The play had gone from Anderson to Elliott to Curtis to Anderson to Trumpy, and the Bengals were finally off and winging. A little later, Ken Anderson found a more direct approach to the end zone. One of the world's fastest linebackers, Robert Brazil, caught up with Isaac Curtis and forced him out of bounds. But the Bengals finally went ahead 24 to 20 in the fourth quarter. And then John Hadle put the Oilers back on top with this pass to running back Ronnie Coleman. 
But all of this was mere preliminary to the fourth down spectacular, which won the game for Cincinnati. Isaac Curtis said, I was a pretty good halfback in college, but the coach used me mostly as a blocker. This is more fun. Original Bengal Bob Trumpy said, we used to lose this type of game, and championship teams need victories like this. We gave Isaac the game ball, but we should have given him a Cadillac. <laughs> 